Would you please start? <clears throat> good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everybody. Welcome to week nine of this focus program. We are halfway through, and we are going to start with lectures by Bill Ross on operators and function spaces. Bill, please. Okay. So uh, uh, thanks to the um, introducer and the organizer of this, uh, Javad. This is a tremendous amount of uh, work uh, and he's only halfway through. Um, uh, also, thanks everybody for sh showing up uh, early or late or wherever you are. Um, so I'm gonna make these slides available, but I think I'm gonna wait until the end of all the talks where I can make all the slides in one file and I'll, I'll take out any typos and I'll take out all the pauses and things like that. Um, and also there'll be a, a survey paper on this by the Field Institute. So if, uh, if you miss anything, it, it'll be in there. So uh, I was asked to give a series of lectures on operators on function spaces. Uh, so this is a very big topic and uh, I, you're gonna have to make some uh, choices. Um, so I'm going to apologize in advance if I made the incorrect choice and your favorite operator isn't on here. So uh, here are the six operators that I'm going to cover. I'm going to cover two per day. Um, and so uh, why did I select these operators? Um, well, uh, these are operators I know something about. Um, and then I also see these operators as inspiration for a lot of other work. Uh, and other talks. Uh, and uh, I'm going to take a historical approach to this whole thing. I'm going to try to mention the original papers. Uh, and then I'm also going to include uh, proofs. I think this talk is meant for uh, new people in the field, uh, graduate students, postdocs. Um, all right, so lecture one is going to be on the Volterra and the Ch Cesaro operators. Um, so I uh, selected the Volterra operator first because I don't have to work very hard defining the ambient space. Uh, it's just L2, 0, 1. Uh, and then the operator is also uh, very easy. It's sort of uh, anti-differentiation. <clears throat> so uh, I'll mention some nice references uh, for this. One is a book by uh, Joel Shapiro, uh, kind of a recent book. And then I'll also mention um, the uh, some of the original work by Volterra. This 96 is 1896. And then sort of a collection of um, Volterra papers on integral operators. So this is sort of the easiest version of the of a Volterra integral operator. I'll mention the, uh, the big class of them at, at the end. All right, so let, let's first of all prove that the, the Volterra operator operates on L2. So uh, the first uh, stop is to prove that the Volterra operator is bounded and uh, it's um, the uh, norm is estimated from above by one over the square root of two. Uh, I'll actually compute the norm ex exactly in a moment, but let's just start slow. So, uh, if you were to take the definition of the Volterra operator, crash through with absolute values, um, and then use the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality uh, and follow your nose, uh, you're going to get this uh, pointwise estimate um, for any f in L2. And now, if I integrate both sides, you'll see the one half. And now, uh, to compute the norm, I'm going to soup over all uh, unit vectors in L2 and um, then take square roots. And that'll show that uh, VF um, is in L2 and, uh, and, the, and the norm of the Voltaire operator is bounded above by one over the square root of two. All right, uh, I, I'm fully aware there's an improvement to be made here, which I'll do in a moment. So with all the operators, I'm gonna be studying here, uh, I'm going to compute the adjoint. It's always important to know what the adjoint is. 
And the Volterra operator, the adjoint, uh, is given by this integral. It's a very similar integral. Instead of integrating from zero to x, you're going to integrate from x to one. All right, so uh, the proof is um, integration by parts. So I teach at an undergraduate college, so integration by parts is my life. All right, so um, for f and g in L2, look at vf inner product with G. So this inner thing right here is VF, and then I'm inner producting it with G, okay? And uh, so uh, if you forgot your integration by parts, uh, U is this piece, and DV is this piece. Apply the integration by parts formula, and uh, things vanish at the boundary, and you get F against this integral. So therefore, uh, th this piece right here has to be the adjoint of V applied to G. All right. Uh, now, uh, now that we have the adjoint formula, uh, an important piece of understanding the Volterra operator is to understand uh, V star V. So this is a self-adjoint operator. Uh, and it's actually uh, compact and we can pick off its eigenvalues and um, the corresponding orthonormal basis of eigenvectors. Uh, but by the way, uh, uh, these Fn's are unit vectors in uh, L201. And uh, by uh, uh, using a Fourier cosine series in L201, this is actually an orthonormal basis. And then uh, from this, uh, I'll also show you that uh, uh, norm of the Volterra operator is two over pi. Okay, so we'll let's get uh, busy with the proof of this. All right, so uh, I have a formula for v and for v star. So the inner integral is v. The outer integral is going to be v star. All right, so to compute eigenvalues, I am going to solve that eigenvalue eigenvector equation. So um, looking for the eigenvalues and eigenvectors for B star B. All right, so differentiate twice. Uh, the minus sign comes from the fact that X is on the bottom. All right, uh, then uh, a little bit of thought will show that uh, F of one is zero and F prime of zero is zero. All right, so then you, ha you have a second order differential equation and you have some boundary conditions. All right, so this will yield the uh, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. I, I won't go through the sophomore differential equations course. All right, now, uh, since uh, the uh, eigenvectors form an orthonormal basis, V star V has a matrix representation with respect to this basis, and it's a diagonal operator. Right, and if you look at the uh, formula for the uh, eigenvalues, notice that they go to zero. So if you have a diagonal operator uh, whose entries go to zero, uh, it'll say it's a compact operator. So V star V is a compact operator. So we have the first part. Now for the, uh, for the norm, uh, Notice that uh, V star V, I have this nice diagonal operator. And a second fact about uh, diagonal operators is that the norm is equal to the supremum of the diagonal entries here, the absolute values of those. So uh, the norm of V squared used the C star algebra identity for uh, norms of operators, right? And then you're computing the norm of this diagonal operator and then take square roots and you're done. As a consequence of all this, uh, V, uh, the Volterra operator is a compact operator. It's kind of a general observation that integral operators, uh, at least the classical ones, usually define compact operators. All right, uh, for this, uh, we, we did all the, all the work um, notice that uh, V star V is um, uh, compact, so uh, you can use the polar decomposition to show that V is uh, compact. So uh, we have a lot of information so far about the Volterra operator. The spectrum, all the operators I'm going to be uh, looking at um, 
I can talk about the spectrum of these operators. Um, first of all, it's just an interesting object to look at. And then there are all these theorems, the spectral theorem and things like that. And knowing what the spectrum is gives you uh, alternate ways of looking at the operator. So the spectrum of the Volterra operator is just the point zero. Uh, and this puts uh, the Volterra operator in a class of operators called uh, quasi-nilpotent operators. All right, so our approach here is going to be to use uh, the spectral radius formula uh, via the Berling-Gelfand theorem. So uh, in order to do that, I need to know what um, powers of the operator are. So uh, if I integrate the formula for the Volterra operator n times, right? Uh, and then you can sort of see I'm integrating x to the n. You have to switch the limits of integration. All right, and then uh, look at a similar estimate I got for the norm of the Volterra operator. And you're going to see that the norm of v to the n decays like a factorial, one over a factorial. All right, so by the spectral radius formula, the um, maximum of the modulus of any element in the spectrum is equal to, so this is the berling gelfand formula, is equal to this limit. All right, so uh, then you need to dust off Stirling's formula to get a, a reasonable estimate on the a, a factorial. But if you do that, you'll show this limit is equal to zero. All right, so this says that the uh, a spectrum of the Volterra operator is contained in the singleton zero. Now use the fact that the spectrum of any bounded operator is non-empty, so the spectrum has to be equal to that singleton zero. All right, uh, the numerical range. So uh, the numerical range of V or any operator um, is going to be a, a tuple. It's called it the field of values. So you look at VF against F, so the inner product of VF against F. And you look at all those numbers where you uh, sample over every unit vector in L2. Right, so uh, the uh, toplitz hausdorff theorem says that's going to be a convex set. It doesn't always have to be closed. Uh, it, uh, the the, the uh, numerical range is, uh, the closure of it is going to have to contain the spectrum. That's a, another general fact. Well, uh, in this case, the numerical range uh, turns out to be this sort of, I don't know, sideward squashed tomato region. So it's the region bounded between these two uh, curves. So here's the, here's the upper one, the plus option, and here's the lower one, the minus option. So it's everything in between, including the two uh, curves. All right, so uh, maybe I won't prove every technical detail it takes to do that, but let me at least put you in the ballpark of where a result like that comes from. All right, so for each theta between 0 and 2, five, uh, 2 pi, you can see this is going to be the parameter of my curve, define f theta of x. So uh, let's look at e to the i theta x. Um, so this is a function on 0, 1. It's a unit vector in, in L2. So it's a, a point I'm going to use to sample to get my numerical range. And if I look at VF, VF theta against F theta, and I do the um, integration, I wind up with this function of theta. And now it's just a matter of taking, separating that into real and imaginary parts. And um, that at least gives you the boundary curves. Uh, you still have a little work to do to show that nothing else is in the numerical range, but that's generally the correct idea. The commutant of the Volterra operator, or any operator, so all the operators I'm going to be studying in these lectures, I'm going to compute the commutant just because it's interesting. So, uh, so uh, V with a little 
prime on it is going to denote the commutant. And these are the operators A that uh, commute with V. So certain obvious elements of the commutant or any polynomial in V. So certainly V commutes with itself as does V squared and V cubed and the, the identity operator commutes with V. So any polynomial in V will commute with V. All right, and uh, a result of uh, Saracen, this is part of his um, H infinity uh, interpolation, uh, which is kind of his operator value, uh, his operator interpolation uh, theory. Um, it turns out that the commutant is the uh, strong operator topology closure of uh, P of V, so the set of all uh, these polynomials. I mentioned a result of Erdos, uh, J. Erdos, not Paul Erdos, um, who gives a, a sort of a, a more direct way of showing this. You don't have to go through the detour of uh, Saracen's uh, um, interpol operator interpolation paper. Um, so th th those of you uh, maybe are uh, a little critical of this result and you, you may think, oh, wait a minute, uh, the Volterra operator is a, essentially a convolution operator, right? It's convolution with the function one. Um, and usually convolution operators uh, commute with uh, each other and they certainly do. And so why isn't every uh, element in the commutant a convolution? Uh, and you can show by certain uh, arguments that that isn't the case. So there are other operators besides uh, convolution operators in the commutant of V. All right, um, the invariance subspaces of the Volterra operator. Uh, this is what's known as the Gelfand problem. All right, so for uh, a number between zero and one, look at this space F sub A. So it's defined to be the characteristic function on uh, A to one of L2 of zero one. This is essentially the functions in L2 of zero one, which are zero almost everywhere on uh, zero to A. All right, so this is a, a closed subspace of L2. Um, you can see that in a number of ways. You can sort of use an Egeros theorem or something like that. Or you can show that the operator of multiplication by this characteristic function will be uh, an orthogonal pr projection of uh, L2 onto the space FA. All right, so uh, if I uh, take a, a, a function in FA, it'll vanish on zero to A almost everywhere. And if I take the Volterra operator, so I integrate from zero to X of that function, and I'll still get a function which vanishes actually everywhere on zero to one, uh, on zero to A, and wh whatever it does after that is its own business. But uh, FA is actually an invariant uh, subspace for V. All right, uh, and uh, the, it turns out uh, the Gelfon asked and a number of people um, answered uh, that these are actually all of the invariant subspaces of the Volterra operator. So uh, or, it was a, a convolution theorem of Agmon that actually prove this, but there are more direct proofs, uh, one by D Donahue and others, they worked in LP. And uh, I point out a paper of uh, Saracen has a very elegant proof of this uh, theorem um, using inner functions. A more modern uh, thinking about the Volterra operator is that it belongs to a a, a set of operators called complex symmetric operators. So uh, let's define this map J on L201. I'm cautious not to say operator because it isn't an operator, uh, it's, it's a map. So it takes a function F, uh, it composes with uh, the function one minus X, and then it takes the conjugate of the whole thing. All right, so a couple things, uh, just do 
the simplest of use substitutions. And um, you can see that this is an isometric map. Um, another thing that you can see is that it's additive, but it's conjugate linear. So J of CF is C bar times J of F. So it's conjugate linear. Uh, another thing you, you can see is that if you do it uh, uh, twice, you get um, the identity operator. And then uh, so a little bit of um, integration with the Volterra operator will show that um, the, the JVJ is equal to V star. So V is not a self-adjoint operator, but it's sort of in a way a self transpose operator. And I'll make that clear in a moment. So uh, sort of operators for which there's a, a conjugation for which this type of property holds, those are called complex symmetric operators. All right, here's an interesting uh, thing. I, I, I teach uh, a linear algebra. As a matter of fact, I'm teaching it this term. So uh, the matrix representation of a linear transformation is kind of near and dear to my heart. So uh, I'll mention this uh, uh, cool observation of uh, Garcia, Proden, and Putinar. So let's look at these functions Fn. A little bit of thought will show this is actually an orthonormal basis for um, L2, 0, 1. Uh, and uh, also, if you work with the uh, with J, you can actually see that J F N is equal to F N. So this is what's known as a J real basis. So we sort of think of the real numbers as uh, ones whose that are fixed by complex conjugation. So you think of the F Ns or J real basis as they're fixed by this uh, conjugation operator J. All right, now with respect to this basis, the, uh, the, these Fn's, the, the matrix representation is this rather cool looking matrix. So um, uh, now uh, observe here that uh, this is not a self-adjoint matrix, but it's a self-transpose matrix. So uh, if you look at this entry here, I over two pi and I over two pi. So in other words, if you flip along the main diagonal, you'll actually get the same matrix back. So that's sort of a, a, an important feature of um, complex symmetric operators. And I'll, I'll mention here that uh, Saracen also proved that the Volterra operator is uh, unitarily equivalent to a truncated Toplitz operator, and I think next week is TTO week, so um, that's a neat feature to have. So I'll mention uh, as we sort of leave Volterra operators, there is the wide class of uh, integral operators. So the Volterra operator is going to be the integral operator, which is the characteristic function on a triangle. So if I have some reasonable kernel k, these Volterra operators um, are well studied by Volterra and many others. I'll refer you to a, a pretty thorough book by um, Gockberg and Crane on this, and, and there are other books. So this is sort of standard fare and look at integral equations of these. Uh, I'll mention one other Volterra operator. So, uh, and then you're free to generalize this as you please. So if you're given any space of analytic functions, right? Just take the antiderivative of it, right, uh, in the disk. So uh, on the Hardy space or even HP, uh, uh, Alexander Aleman and Boris Kornblum actually sort of study these things uh, in various subspaces and things that Donahue studied about these Volterra operators. Uh, these uh, go on, the uh, Volterra operators are, are important. And matter of fact, there's going to be a talk later on today about Volterra operators. But I need to make some choices, and I'm choosing to um, move on to the Cesaro operator. So, uh, excuse me. So, uh, the Cesaro operator, 
uh, it's uh, an integral operator uh, on H2, and here's uh, what it is. So H2 is a square summable power series on the, uh, on the disk. So for uh, uh, an F in H2 and a Z inside the disk, uh, certainly this integrand is defined for C in the disk. And now I integrate that from zero to Z. Uh, this is a perfectly well-defined analytic function that vanishes at zero. And then I divide out that zero. Um, so this is not the original version of the Cesaro operator, but I'm gonna be using uh, several different uh, ways of uh, talking about it. I'll mention some early papers of this. So at Cesaro, Ernesto Cesaro in 1890 used uh, uh, the Cesaro, what's known as the Cesaro averages in his uh, summability theory. And a lot of what I'm gonna be uh, talking about uh, in, with regards to basic properties of the Chazar operator comes from a, a 1965 paper by Brown, Halmos, and Shields. All right, so uh, CF is gonna be a nice analytic function on the disk. And so uh, one should know what its uh, power series is. Uh, and you can actually just uh, work this out. So one minus C or, or you could use a, write one over that as a, geometric series and just integrate. You, you can see the integrating z to the power n, you get the one over n plus one here. So let's take a close look. So the power series coefficients of um, CF, these are, notice these are the um, average of the first n plus one Fourier coefficients of F. So these are the Cesaro averages. All right, so if we want to prove this is an operator on H2, I need to show that this is a square summable sequence here. Well, uh, luckily I didn't have to wait too long because uh, Hardy did this. Um, and uh, so if you have a sequence of uh, non-negative numbers and you take their average, square them and add them, you get this is less than or equal to 16 times this uh, sum of the squares of the b's. Now, there are p versions of this as, as well. All right, so uh, this immediately gives you that the Cesaro operator is a bounded operator on H2, and uh, the norm is at most four. Okay, as with the Volterra operator, um, we're going to actually uh, improve that a lot. All right, so uh, the original way of thinking about the Cesaro operator was by means of the Cesaro matrix. All right, so, um, all right, having a little trouble advancing here. All right, so um, if I have CF, right, so this is the Cesaro operator. So now if, uh, if you were, uh, so the monomial basis for H2 is one Z, Z, Z squared. So if you apply C of one, you get the first column, C of Z, you get the second, third and fourth. And notice you have this um, beautiful uh, patterned matrix. It's called the Cesaro matrix. Uh, and notice what happens if you, uh, take this matrix and multiply it by a vector in L2, what you're gonna get is each slot, right, of the result is gonna be the average of the first K terms, right? So, and Ch Cesaro used this uh, to define a way you could add up a series that were not uh, summable in the traditional sense. So by the way, uh, if, you're, uh, if you know about uh, Shor's test, you can actually fashion a proof of uh, the boundedness of the Cesaro operator via the Cesaro matrix using uh, Shor's test. You still get uh, a, a norm at most four. Okay, so let's uh, look at the adjoint of the Cesaro matrix. So in one sense, the, uh, the adjoint is, well, just take the adjoint of the matrix. 
And uh, if you work backwards from the uh, matrix on the right, you can actually read off the power series of the adjoint. All right, so uh, you have the uh, power series uh, coefficients are these sums from j is equal to n to infinity. Uh, and if you, uh, a little bit of thought working with uh, power series shows this nice integral formula for the uh, Cesaro operator. So uh, you can think of the Cesaro operator as an integral operator and its adjoint will also be an integral operator. <clears throat> One of the things you're gonna see as, as we go here is I wanna use both the um, integral uh, definition of the Cesaro operator. And in a moment, I actually want to use the matrix definition of the Cesaro operator uh, in use to discussing things that I'd like to know about it. And here is the first instance of you can use both. So uh, the norm of the Cesaro operator is uh, equal to two. Um, and here's the proof. So uh, if you look at i minus c times i minus c star, just multiply those matrices, you actually get a diagonal operator. And diagonal operators are great because I can compute their norms easily. It's just gonna be the supremum of the modulus of their entries. All right, so the norm squared of i minus c by the c star algebra identity for operators is uh, gonna be the norm of this diagonal operator, which is one. All right, so uh, and then if, um, uh, if to compute the norm of C, I add and subtract uh, uh, the identity operator, use the triangle inequality, and both those sum ends have uh, norm one, so I get the Cesaro operator is bounded above by two. Uh, a little bit of more work, you can get the lower bound by uh, sampling C star uh, on an appropriate set of vectors. Eigenvalues. So this is gonna play a huge role in understanding a very important uh, property of the uh, Cesaro uh, operator. So here I'm going to be using, in the previous slide, I used a matrix definition of the Cesaro operator to get a um, property of the Cesaro operator. Here I'm actually going to be using the uh, integral definition. So uh, let's look at these vectors. Um, so for a parameter in the disk, look at this analytic function on the disk. All right, um, so notice that one minus Z, if Z is in the disk, this uh, function is uh, a, uh, has no zeros in the disk. So I can take its uh, power and it's via the logarithm. And let's uh, arrange the branch of the logarithm so that uh, phi of W of zero is equal to one, All right? So in other words, one to this power is, is we'll interpret that as one. All right, so these are nice analytic functions on the disk. And I claim these are actually going to be eigenvalues. So if they're going to be eigenvalues, they had better belong to H2. All right. Uh, it's a little bit of a, of a tricky um, power series uh, computation, or you can do it via an, an integral estimate. Um, you can show that these belong to H2. And then uh, these functions form a total set in H2. And you can actually see this because if you let W is equal to N over N plus one, where N is a positive integer, phi of N over N plus one, it turns out to be uh, one minus Z to the nth power. Okay, so you can show that the linear span of these things certainly contain all the polynomials. And if they can contain all the polynomials, then their closure is going to be H2. All right, now use the integral estimate, uh, use the integral definition of the adjoint of the Cesaro operator. And uh, these uh, functions turn out to be eigenvectors with these are your eigenvalues. So the eigenvalues of the Cesaro operator fill a disk that's shifted over 
uh, with, a, with a radius one, it's center at one. All right, so now we're in business here because uh, I can tell a lot about the spectrum of the Cesaro operator. Uh, maybe I won't really prove uh, all this stuff, but uh, the point spectrum of the Cesaro operator is actually the empty set. Uh, and you can see this, just take CF is equal to lambda F. So uh, use the integral definition of the Cesaro operator and kind of follow your nose. And you'll see that there are no uh, F except zero that satisfies CF is equal to lambda F. The, we've already seen uh, that the, uh, the, the eigenvalues of C, right? At least a bunch of them, it's gonna be this shifted disk. And now it re remains to argue that those are the only eigenvalues. Uh, by the way, they have multiplicity one. All right, so uh, now use the uh, fact that um, the, uh, the relationship between the spectrum of the operator and its adjoint, they're just uh, conjugates of each other. All right, so then the, uh, the uh, spectrum certainly contains this open disk, so therefore it will contain the closure of that, and now it's a matter to diddle that it doesn't contain anything else. All right, so the uh, closure of the numerical range contains the spectrum, uh, and um, you can argue that the, uh, the numerical range is actually equal to that open disk. So we know quite a lot about the spectral theory of the classical Cesaro operator. The, my opinion, the gem of uh, the studying the Cesaro operator on H2 is this wonderful result that the Cesaro operator is a subnormal operator. Uh, and I'd like to uh, go through uh, pieces of this, certainly not dive into every technical detail of the proof, because I, I think it really uh, shows off the relationship between operator theory and function uh, theory and spaces of analytic functions. So a subnormal operator is the restriction of a normal operator. So a normal operator is one that commutes with its adjoint. So a, a subnormal operator is a normal operator restricted to one of its invariant subspaces. So that's the uh, short version of it. The long-winded version of it is that uh, uh, an operator S on a Hilbert space H is subnormal if there's a containing Hilbert space and a normal operator on the containing Hilbert space that for, uh, leaves H invariant and then the restriction of N to H is equal to S. So people use the language that S, a subnormal operator is one that has a normal extension. So two obvious at least to me, they're obvious. Uh, subnormal operators are the Hardy and Bergman shifts. So both these operators are defined on, you know, clear subspaces of L2. The first one is L2 of the circle, and the second one is L2 of the disk, right? And uh, they're both uh, the restriction of multiplication by Z to their corresponding space of analytic functions. Multiplication by Z on any L2 space, we'll talk about that more tomorrow, is always a normal operator. And so those are kind of the obvious examples of subnormal operators. The Dirichlet shift is not a subnormal operator because it's not hyponormal. And uh, the classical backward shift on H2 is not a, a subnormal operator either. I mentioned this just to make sure we all understand that, um, you know, this subnormal operators are a class of operators and not a, a universal property of them. So uh, Conway has a, a wonderful treatise on these things. Um, but there's been uh, significant work that's followed in subnormal operators past uh, Conway's 1991 treatment. All right, so here's the, here's the prize here. It's a result of uh, uh, Tom Creed and David Trutt, is that the Cesaro operator is a subnormal operator. Now, think about this 
a little bit. For the operators that I mentioned before, the shift and on the Hardy and Bergman spaces, right? They sort of have kind of an obvious subnormal, uh, an obvious normal extension. If you think about the Ch Cesaro operator, it's defined on H2 in a kind of this weird integral way. So it's not obvious that it has a normal extension, right? And even with the proof of the uh, subnormality of the Cesaro operator, it's still not obvious what the normal extension is. All right, so I'd like to give you uh, an outline of this proof because it makes connections with, I think is a very fascinating operator on a, a very interesting space of analytic functions. So step one, Okay, I'm having trouble advancing here. Step one is to show that any operator that's unitarily equivalent to a subnormal operator is a subnormal operator. So the hand-waving version of the proof of that, so if I have a subnormal operator that's unitarily equivalent to a mystery operator, right? Uh, the subnormal operator has a, a normal extension and it turns out you can extend the definition of the uh, unitary operator so that it'll actually carry the normal extension of the known subnormal operator to a normal extension of the mystery operator. It, it just write it down as a matrix and you'll see exactly what I mean. All right, so I just need to show that uh, the Cesaro operator is unitarily equivalent to a, a subnormal operator. All right, so we're going to do this by looking at the eigenvalues, the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of the uh, adjoint of the Cesaro operator. This is a, a trick um, sort of popularized by Burling in his uh, 1949 paper. Okay, so we uh, uh, learn that uh, these uh, uh, phi's are actually eigenvectors for the adjoint of the Cesaro operator. I choose to write the eigenvalue and eigenvector relationship in this way. So now I want to use this to define a Hilbert space of analytic functions. So I uh, take one of these eigenvectors, I put a bar on the parameter, and then I take its inner product with a function in H2. All right, so uh, I claim that's actually an analytic function. Now, I know it doesn't look like an analytic function immediately, but keep in mind, because there's a bar on the Z, but keep in mind the, the bar is attached to the second slot, right? And the um, integration in Hilbert spaces is on the second slot. I teach a mathematical physics at Richmond, and I have to put the bar on the first slot sometime for my physics courses. But anyway, in Hilbert spaces, it's on the second slot. So this is an analytic function on the disk. And now I'm going to make it a Hilbert space by decree, right? So I'm going to define the norm of one of these capital Fs to be the norm of the F in H2. So this is kind of the range norm that Dan Timo team was talking about in his talk. Okay, so uh, you, you don't do this because it's Tuesday. There are some things to check. You, you want to check that if the norm of capital F is zero, the norm of little f is zero. And that follows from the totalness of the um, eigenvectors. All right, so now I can define a unitary operator from H2 to script H, right? Uh, kind of in the obvious way. Well, let's see what, what we get. So uh, if I take U of uh, I minus C for an H2 function evaluated at Z, well, here's the definition of U, right? Then I move the C star to the other side, right? And now I use the fact that uh, phi is actually an eigenvector. And then I notice that the uh, variable of integration, thankfully, is not z bar. So it comes outside as a, as a constant. And then I'm looking at z times u. All right, so this says uh, a couple things here. First of all, it says that multiplication by z 
is actually a well-defined and bounded operator that's unitarily equivalent to I minus C. All right, so I'm gonna state that as the uh, Chisara operator is unitarily equivalent to multiplication by one minus Z on H. So now you can see, well, okay, so uh, I don't understand the Chisara operator, but I certainly understand multiplication by one minus Z. That's very easy to do. Now, the only complication is that the space is H is a little complicated. So here's the magic of the Crete and Trut result. So the uh, C to the N, that's an orthonormal basis for H2. So these uh, psi Ns, right, are going to be the unitary image of these monomials. So they will also be an orthonormal basis. And something called what, the, the air delay integral formula will actually give you uh, a nice closed formula for these Us. Now, I can multiply each one of those functions by z minus one to the power n, uh, and that's okay, and I get a polynomial. And uh, so uh, you can use this to fashion an argument that H contains the polynomials as a dense set. Okay, so the real uh, gem of this is that you can renorm at least on the polynomials, you can renorm H by uh, an L2 integral norm. So for any polynomial P, uh, there's, I can, uh, the L2 norm of P is actually equal to the square of the H norm. So as a corollary to this is that um, the Chisaro operator is unitarily equivalent to multiplication by one minus Z on what we're calling P2 mu. So this is the closure of the polynomials in L2. All right, so the uh, multiplication by one minus Z on L2 of any measure in the plane, that's certainly gonna be a normal operator. You can certainly just write down the adjoint as multiplication by one minus Z bar. So that's a normal operator. So therefore, um, multiplication by one minus Z on P2 has a normal ex extension. So if multiplication by one minus Z is uh, subnormal, so is C. Uh, a couple little tidbits here. Um, the, uh, you can actually describe the commutant of uh, the Chisaro operator. It's the weak operator topology closure of the polynomials. And by the, uh, the Crete Trut um, construction is you can identify the uh, commutant with um, the multiplier algebra of this space script H. And what's sort of interesting here and important is that this multiplier algebra is all of H infinity. Usually a multiplier algebra on a space of analytic functions is not. It's contained in H infinity, but it's not always equal to H infinity. All right, so uh, we have a lot of understanding with the Crete Trut result. Let me uh, mention here uh, that the ambient space H has sort of uh, properties like the Berkman space, meaning the invariance subspaces are very pathological. They have all these weird properties. So the same is gonna be true for the Chisaro operator. And you can be intimidated by that. Uh, I know I am, um, but you can also be inspired by that. So, uh, you, you know, with the, this, uh, these, uh, this mu is not a, a magic mu. It's actually, a, you can actually write down a formula for it. Um, so uh, worth exploring more. And I'll end with some generalizations of the uh, Chisaro operator. Uh, these are mentioned in Daniel Gorella's talk. Uh, you can uh, put in the derivative of any analytic function you want, right? And that integral will certainly be uh, defined and give you an analytic function. Um, you can show this is bounded on H2, and I think the same is for HP, if and only if G is a function of bounded mean oscillation. Uh, 
And uh, if G is equal to this logarithm, right, that's in BMOA, that's sort of your uh, uh, go-to example of an unbounded function in BMOA. Uh, take the derivative of that and you get the Cesaro operator. And now you're free to define this on your favorite Hilbert space of analytic functions. You can look at whatever properties you, you like um, on this. All right, so that's the end of the first uh, lecture. I hope you'll come back for the other two. So thank you. Thank you indeed, Bill. Let's thank the speaker. Any question or comments for Bill? I have a question. Yes, Michael. Um, this, this is maybe overly fussy, but uh, so, so when, you, when you talk about the commutant of the Cesaro operator, you said it's the watt closure of the polynomials. Right. Right, which is what you expect, because the, the, the commutant will be at least that big trivially, but then there's nothing else. Right. Um, and I think, maybe I'm just remembering it wrong, but I think when you stated, talked about the commutant for the Volterra operator, you said SOT closure. Yes. Okay, so then that means there's, so, so that means there, there's a, Theorem hidden in there that for the Volterra operator, the SOT closure of the polynomials is equal to the watt closure. Indeed. So is that is that interesting? I mean, well, I mean, it's sort of it, it sounds interesting, but because there's anything to say about that? Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, off the top of my head, uh, you know, so Mike, I'm actually uh, working on a book on, on on all of this, and it's a it's an exercise in the in the book, but I've uh, for, forgotten how to do it. Uh, so you, you, <laughs> okay, you, yeah, you, 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 you sort of caught me at the quick here. So anyway, that, that well, is I a, sure that, that, I, that I read it right, and it wasn't just a typo or something. No, no, it's 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 actually correct. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, there is a question by Marco in chat. Uh, do we know the? Uh, ranges of these operators. Uh, the Volterra operator, uh, certainly, it's the absolutely continuous uh, functions which uh, that are whose derivative is an L2, and there's probably a vanishing uh, condition here. And I think there is information about uh, uh, Alexandru Aleman had a series of students. Um, I was the opponent on one of their PhD thesis, and I think she did some work on the range of the uh, Cesaro operator, actually. And she, she had a version of generalizations of the Cesaro operator to certain Bergman spaces. So there is information about the range I of- I don't remember very well, but yeah, we could check. Right, so. Yeah, and then uh, you had some other students that uh, around her her time that we're looking at the ranges of these operators or their resolvents. That might be my... Any further comments or questions? Well, this is Sheldon, beautiful talk, Bill. Just Thank wanted you. to mention an alternative proof of one of the results you gave that the um, spectrum of the Volterra operator is just zero. Um, you use the spectral radius formula um, it might be easier to use, you'd already proved that the Volterra operator is compact. And that means that all points of the spectrum, except possibly zero, are eigenvalues. Right. And I'll just write out the eigenvalue eigenvector equation. And you get nothing, yeah. You get nothing, yes, you no. right. Uh, um, you can also prove, uh, yeah, so, uh, right. Another exercise for the book. All right, so. Uh, yes, <laughs> thank you, Sheldon. Another next well, Thank you. <laughs> okay, I took that down. Perfect, thanks. If no further comment, let's thank Bill again. Thank you so much. Thank you.